Welcome to No Better Death, the podcast that knows while you can die no better death than your own, that doesn't mean we can't take a look for the unusual and the noteworthy in the deaths of others. Each episode, we'll take an in-depth look at some out-of-the-ordinary deaths and the events surrounding them. This show will contain explicit language and graphic details. I am your host, Sick Grayson. Bonfires burning bright, pumpkin faces in the night. I remember Halloween, dead cats hanging from poles, little dead are out in droves. I remember Halloween. What up, everybody? Uh, Let me just get this out of the way. I owe you a massive apology. This episode was supposed to be out by November 1st uh, because, you know, last episode was dead on Halloween part one. And if you die on Halloween, your body is found on November 1st. So I was going to drop part two on November 1st, but my head just has not been in the game lately. Uh, You know, I've got two kids, so Halloween's always busy taking them around to do things. Plus, it's my anniversary. My wife and I were celebrating, uh, I believe previously I had said 13. Uh, I misspoke. This was actually our 12th anniversary. Uh, So things were just sort of busy that whole week. Plus, my mom had two heart attacks that same week. And just being worried about her, I wasn't in the mood to record. Uh, So I do apologize for getting this to you late. Uh, and I'm going to try to jump right into the stories. We're not going to do headlines today. Uh, and I've really only got one update uh, since the last episode. And that was I went to see the new Halloween the second day it was out. And boy, howdy, loved it. You know, after being left with the LL Cool J Busta Rhymes abortions from the early 2000s, I wasn't really expecting much. I didn't watch any previews or read about it. I just went in raw and was blown away. We have a legit sequel. The acting, the stories, the sets, all of it, so great. Tons of Easter eggs that pay homage to the original series. Plus, if I choose to, now I can ignore everything after the first movie. I don't have to stay awake at night anymore wondering what happened to Josh Hartnett's character or Paul Rudd's character or little Steven Strode. I don't have to ask those questions anymore if I don't want to. And uh, not to spoil anything, but I'm just going to say right here, Lady in the Window, go watch it. When you see the woman in the window, know that what's about to happen was one of my favorite parts. It's fucking brutal. Alright, stories. Uh, In the first part of Dead on Halloween, we look at three famous deaths. Ramon Navarro, Harry Houdini, and River Phoenix. For part two, we're going to look at the common folk. The uh, John Cougar Mellencamp slash Bruce Springsteen demographic of Halloween deaths in the U.S. of A., The uh, probably die in a small town section of Halloween deaths. Uh, Two things. I won't be discussing the Candyman killer. Uh, Georgia and Karen talked about that on their Halloween episode, and I try not to cover things that have been done by other podcasts, especially that recently. So if you're looking for the Candyman killer story, you're not going to find it here, uh, which bleeds into the second thing. I really try to stay away from stories about children dying. With you know, Having kids of my own, it really bugs me. And I don't find much entertainment value in the deaths of children. You know, This show is supposed to be entertaining, and when I can, I try to throw in a little bit of humor, and that just doesn't happen when you're talking about a child being found stuffed in a plastic bag after trick-or-treating. It's just, that's no fun, it's not entertaining, and it bums me out. Uh, so we're, we're not going to be covering the Lisa French story or anything like that. Uh, Oh, and spoiler alert, I guess I will say something about the new Halloween. If you haven't seen it, cover your ears for the next few seconds. There's been a lot of controversy about the kid he killed and Michael never killed kids before and all that shit. That kid had a gun and could drive. He presented himself as an adult and he got what adults get from Michael Myers. That other kid played his cards right. He cried for the babysitter, he ran around screaming, and Michael let him go. Because that was a kid. You got a gun and a set of car keys and you're over the age of five. You're acting like an adult and you get what you get. That's my thoughts on that. All right, first story. 1963. Remember when I used to do that? Like the first three episodes? November 1st, 1963. We're talking about the death of Catherine Lillian Armstrong. The bulk of what follows was taken from articles by truecrimeenthusiast.wordpress and chroniclelive.uk. 70-year-old Catherine Lillian Armstrong was your classic school marm. My old school marm, to quote the dean from How High. Uh, Before retiring in 1957, 
she had been the headmistress of Denton Road Junior School. A spinster having never married, she lived alone all her life on a corner lot in her typical quiet neighborhood. That's neighborhood with a U because we're in England. Uh, she was a very proud and independent woman. After her retirement, her life seemed to revolve around the Central Methodist Church, where as a devout Methodist, she had been part of the congregation for more than 40 years and an active member of the choir for the same length of time. Her social life consisted of little more than regular choir practice at 7.30 on Thursday nights, which she was due to attend that Halloween. Sadly, she would be unable to attend. The following morning around 10.30, Catherine's cousin Ada stopped by for her usual morning visit. Knowing that her cousin was an early riser, Ada became concerned when knocks on the door went unanswered. She also noticed all the curtains were closed, which was unusual for Catherine. Concerned that her cousin was hurt or ill, Ada called the police. When they arrived, officers forced their way into the house and upon doing so made a grim discovery. Lying near the bottom of the stairs was Catherine's body, wearing a dress and slippers with a nylon stocking tied around her neck. Her face and neck were covered in bruises, stabs, cuts, and blood. Cause of death was determined to be shock and blood loss due to being beaten and stabbed at least 28 times. Defense wounds on her hands suggested that she had tried to fight off her attacker or attackers. An investigation was launched and police searched for motive in the horrific killing. There was no sign of forced entry, no signs of robbery, and no sign of sexual assault. No weapon, fingerprints, or footprints were found. Police had no clear motive or suspects, and they really didn't know where to begin. All police leave was canceled, and those already on leave were recalled to assist in the investigation. That's how serious they took this murder. If you were a British cop who had flown your family to, say, Orlando to visit Disney World a day or two before, you got a call on November 2nd and was like, Oi! We got us a murder! Vacations console! How shitty would that be? But I guess they needed the manpower, right? They had a murder and absolutely nothing to go on. A 60-man team of detectives began the hunt for Catherine's killer. First, they needed to find the weapon, believed to be a long-bladed knife of some kind. All garbage cans, dumpsters, and storm drains in the area were searched, as well as parks, streams, and gardens, but nothing was found. Meanwhile, investigators began going door to door speaking of what would end up being more than 5,000 people, but not one person claimed to have seen or heard anything suspicious. The next step was to call Scotland Yard. That's the equivalent of calling in the FBI in America. When the local cops can't cut it, you call Scotland Yard. And when Scotland Yard can't cut it, they call Sherlock Holmes. Detective Superintendent Eric Reed was sent from the Scotland Yard Murder Squad, which sounds like a cheesy 80s flick, Murder Squad, uh, to oversee the investigation. And Reed was quick to utilize the press in an appeal for witnesses and information. In an interview at the time with the Newcastle Evening Chronicle, he revealed that there was no sign of forced entry, so she probably knew her killer, and they were considering the possibility that it was one or more people. They were mostly looking at male criminals who had previously served prison sentences for assaulting older women and teenagers because, of course, anyone over the age of 40 thinks if there's a crime, it had to be a teenager, right? Teenagers are looking to break into this lady's house and murder her for no reason and were able to leave such a clean crime scene, right? Does that sound right to you? No. A teenager can barely jack off without making a mess all over the house. They can't kill somebody like this and not make a mess. This sounds like an experienced pro to me, but what do I know? I'm just an idiot with a microphone. He pretty much told the public everything they had and begged for anybody with information or anybody who might have seen anything to come forward, but pretty much the only per people that came forward were the two little kids who had seen her in her window around 6.30 on Halloween. After that, nobody saw anything and she was supposed to be at choir practice by 7.30. So somewhere within that hour of her being seen in the window by the kids walking by and her not arriving at choir practice, she was either already dead or being killed. By January 1964, police had spoken to more than 16,000 people. So, I mean, just in the days around the murder, they talked to 5,000, didn't find anything. They just kept questioning people and questioning people. 16,000 people. I don't know how big this town is, but 16,000 people is a sizable chunk of any town. 
Uh, but unfortunately, this still rendered no information. They had just as much to go on by January of the next year as they had the day they found the body. And to this day, the murder remains unsolved. Ada, the cousin that found Catherine, offered her own theory about what had happened. She was convinced that teenagers were responsible for the brutal murder and had killed Lillian after entering her home as part of a Halloween prank. She also expressed great regret that Catherine had not moved closer to her family, saying, My cousin's home was big, dark, and gloomy. It got no sun. Time and time again I told her she should leave and take a flat near me, but she was very independent, and she said she was not at all afraid of living alone. Okay, uh, for one, murder is not a prank. The only time murder has ever been a prank is that SNL skit where Christopher Walken pranked the dude to death with a tire iron. You know what I'm saying? Murder's not a prank. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting, and I'm sorry this one's so short, but, I mean, the cops have no details, so there's no details really to go into the article. Um, but it says that Catherine's house remained empty for a few years, and someone finally moved in in 1973. And here's where it gets interesting. I mean, the, the part about the murder is over. That's really all the information there is. It was Halloween. She was seen at 6.30. She didn't show up at 7.30. She was found the next day dead as fuck, having been stabbed to death a bunch of times with no evidence. So there's not really much for the story in that regard. Catherine's house remained empty for a few years, but by 1973, new tenants bought the house and moved in. I don't know why they say tenants. If you buy the house, you're the owner, you're not a tenant. But anyway, uh, maybe it's an English thing. 1973, some, some people bought the house, and they lived there for about two or three months and left really quick. A woman named Joan Black bought the house, and this is what she said about the house at the time. She told this to the Chronicle, the same paper that the superintendent blah, blah, blah from Murder Squad had talked to about the, uh, the murder originally. Uh, talking to the same paper, Joan Black, who bought the house, said... The family who were here before said the place had a ghost and was spooky. They had sensed a presence and more than once had claimed to have seen a figure which stood in the corner of their eye, but that there was no one there when they turned their head. We don't believe it's true, although the first lodger we had was convinced there was something unusual about the place, and it was always at the bottom of the stairs. So they opened this for like a, a bed and breakfast or uh, whatever an Airbnb would have been in 1973 or hotel, something like that. Like they were taking lodgers and the first one they got said, no, there's a lady standing at the bottom of the stairs. And that's where they found Catherine's body, right? So it would stand to reason that if there's a ghost standing at the bottom of the stairs, that's the ghost of Catherine. Maybe there's some unfinished business. She wants her murder solved and the police have fuck all on this. Uh, so I guess if anyone out there has any information on the murder of Miss Catherine Lillian, na, 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 whatever her name was, it's been so long since I started this story I forgot, which probably means I smoked too much weed, uh, contact Scotland Yard. Now on to a tale of murder and a lesbian love triangle. Oh yeah, I'ma be a typical gross dude and drool cause somebody said this lady kisses other ladies and I like to watch ladies kiss ladies. Woo, shooting them up and strapping them on. No, oh my God, I'm so not that guy. Enough of that shit. Uh, this is the trick or treat murder of 1957. 1957, something about JFK. Do -do 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 -do. Goldine Pizer sat in a parked car in Sun Valley, the sort of copycat California suburb Malvina Reynolds sang about in Little Boxes. It was Halloween, 1957. Next to Pizer was Joan Rabel, a photographer, ex-hair salon employee, and lesbian from Philadelphia. Like Pizer, Rabel had concealed her lesbianism in a failed marriage. Untethered, the women formed a powerful bond. They had planned the murder for months as the vague wish turned into a solid, horrible truth. They played out each variation in the script again and again until every detail was polished and perfect. They thought of everything. One was the brains behind the killing, and the other one was the willing, gullible stooge. Neither could have done it alone, but the odd chemistry formed a murderous bond between the two women. The first step took more than a month as Joan laid the groundwork for the killing, continually telling Goldine that the victim deserved to die. She painted him as a vile, evil man who wanted to destroy all people around him, Goldine said. Although I had never seen him, 
I built up an intense hatred for him. Next, they had to choose a method. They decided they couldn't use poison or a knife. They needed a gun. With a male friend, Goldine went to a Pasadena gun shop to select a 38 Smith & Wesson for home protection. Three days later, Joan took her to the store and gave her the money to buy the revolver and two bullets. I, do they even sell single bullets? How do you buy just two bullets? Don't they come in a box of like 50? It's been a hot minute since I've owned or operated a gun in any capacity because I don't need one, really. I don't think I do. But I, I don't recall just a box of Lucy's in the gun store, you know. But uh, somehow uh, they sold her two bullets and a 38. And then they sat outside the house on Community Street in the car Joan had borrowed from a friend, carefully rehearsing the final details as they waited for the victim to turn out the lights. Goldine was wearing the costume Joan had selected for her. Blue jeans, a khaki jacket, red gloves, and makeup. I, that sounds like clothes. That doesn't sound like a costume. Anyway, she had the gun in a paper bag so people would think she was sipping on a fody. No, it was to make it look like she was trick-or-treating. About 11.30 p.m., the bedroom lights at the house they were parked in front of went out, and with Joan's help, Goldine put on the Halloween mask and walked to the door and rang the bell. Inside, Peter Fabiano went downstairs, thinking a tardy trick-or-treater was at the door. It's a little late for this, isn't it, he said as he opened the door. No, Pizer replied, shaking as she raised a brown paper bag she was holding and braced something inside with both hands. A shot rang out, the bag ruptured, and Peter fell. Pizer ran back to the car. Rabel kissed her and whispered, thank you, before speeding off. In later testimony, the women revealed that they then burned their clothes and returned the car to the friend they'd borrowed it from. Forget you ever knew me, Rabel said to Pizer before parting ways. The next day, realizing she still had the 38 Smith & Wesson revolver from the night before, Pizer rented a locker at a department store in downtown LA where she left the gun. Betty Fabiano, wife of Peter, who had just been murdered, found her husband with a bullet lodged just below his heart. Judy Solomon, Betty's 15-year-old daughter from a previous marriage, called the police. Peter was rushed to a nearby hospital, but he never woke up. Betty remained sedated for a few days before making herself available for questioning. Betty told police she'd heard two voices that night, one masculine and one like a man impersonating a woman. That's just weird. Peter and Betty had met in the late 1940s. He was an ex-Marine, and she was a beautiful divorcee with two children. Peter hired Joan Rabel to work in one of his hair salons. Rabel was a 40-year-old freelance photographer who'd spent some time taking writing classes at the University of Honolulu. She soon became close to the couple, so close that when Peter and Betty's marriage started having problems, Betty moved in with Rabel. There was only one person Betty could think of that might want to harm Peter, and that was Joan Rabel. There's never been confirmation that Betty and Joan had any kind of romantic relationship, but it is believed that there either was, as Joan was a known lesbian, or Joan wanted a romantic relationship that Betty didn't desire, and that enraged Joan to the point of wanting to kill Peter when Betty went back to him on the condition that Betty terminate her friendship with Joan. So they went through these marital troubles, whatever, Peter and Betty. Betty moves out for a while, goes to live with Joan. They work out whatever their issue is, but Peter says, you can't be friends with Joan anymore if you come back. I mean, if he was threatened by whatever their relationship was, to me, that kind of says there was something going on there. If that's the first place she jumps to to go stay when they're having trouble, and it's such a big deal that he tells her to cut off the friendship, Maybe there was, you know, I don't know. Again, I'm just an idiot with a microphone, but just based on how people operate, what I know of people kind of seems like there was probably something there. Otherwise, Peter wouldn't have been threatened. Police picked Rabel up, but soon released her due to lack of evidence. However, ballistics traced the weapon to its owner, and that weapon was found in a department store locker two weeks later. It was registered to a lab assistant at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. 42-year-old Goldine Pizer. According to federal census data, Pizer was born in Rockford, Illinois, the daughter of German immigrants. And by 1940, she had moved to Los Angeles and taken up work as a secretary. On November 29, 1944, she had married Herbert Crome, a pharmacist at the Naval Hospital. They soon got divorced, leaving room for her to indulge her then-taboo proclivities with women. 
Police arrested Pizer on November 12th. According to the Kingsport Times News, she confessed, claiming that Rabel had seduced and coerced her into shooting Peter. Rabel was arrested soon after, and both women hired lawyers. In early December, police arranged a face-to-face -face meeting between Joan Rabel and Goldine Pizer and their lawyers. She told me that Mr. Fabiano was a vile, evil man, a man who destroyed everything around him, said Pizer. She told me that he mistreated his wife and he was dealing narcotics. She then told police that she'd bought a gun using money Joan had given her and explained how they'd driven by the Fabiano's home weeks before the murder so she could recognize him. During this entire confession, Joan Rabel remained silent. Pizer and Rabel's trial was scheduled for late December. The Valley News reported a judge ordered three psychiatrists to examine the women. Pizer told one of them, I had no motive personally. Whatever motive I had was to please Joan. I was always easily influenced. I've been impressionable and always trusting. After hearing Pizer's account of the murder, the psychiatrist wrote, the only thought she had was that she had saved her friend, Joan Rabel, from an evil person. At the trial, both women pleaded innocent, Pizer by reason of insanity. Pizer wept as she recounted the night of the shooting in front of a jury. Reports say Joan Rabel smiled as she was led out of court that day. The women were charged with first-degree murder, which was eventually reduced to second-degree murder after they made a plea deal. The judge sentenced them to five years to life in prison. According to the LA Times, Pizer was eventually released and remained in the Los Angeles area. In 1971, she was made an officer of the Miracle Mile chapter of the Professional Women's Club. Pizer died at the age of 83 in 1998. Rabel was presumably released at some point, though there's little trace of her after 1957. And Betty went on to live a full life, as far as we know, passing away at the age of 81 in 1999. In April 1958, the Valley News Sun published an article criticizing the recent leniency of local judges and prosecutors on criminals. What was referred to as the trick-or-treat murder was cited as an example of women being treated softly in the courtroom. But we saw this all the time back in the day, right? Uh, didn't Ramon Navarro's murderers only do something about seven years? And Vincent Groves, a serial killer we talked about from a previous episode, only did five years for his first murder? Was murder just not that big of a deal back then or something? It's really weird. And so what? Uh, Joan wanted Betty. Betty didn't want her. Betty went back to Peter. Joan seduces Goldine. Goldine shoots Peter. Goldine and Joan go to prison, get out, and the three ladies grow old separately, never speaking to each other, and die of old age. There was no point to this fucking murder. Nothing happened to improve anyone's life. If you're going to kill someone's husband so you can have them, you might want to make sure they actually want you and are okay with you killing their husband. Could this Joan lady not get laid anywhere else? I ask my, myself this all the time. How many people wouldn't be dead if we stopped sex shaming everyone? You know, I'm talking suicides, murders, risky behavior that leads to getting shit like AIDS. All of it combined. How many people have died over getting laid or trying to get laid? If we were just allowed to be as freaky as we want to be and have whatever preferences we want and let it be known to the world so we could find others with the same kinks and preferences that match us, we could all get out this sexual tension in a good way and wouldn't need to resort to murder. What if Joan had Tinder or whatever the lesbian version of Tinder was in 1957? She wouldn't have been worried about killing Betty's husband because she would have been at home swiping right, swimming elbows deep in sexy lady parts. That's all I'm saying. Stop kink shaming. Stop making fun of people for their sexual preferences. Stop being homophobic and stop worrying about what other people do in their bedroom. Let's just live and let live and all get along and not murder each other over pin up lust and sexual tension. I mean, I, we will, we have covered and we will continue to cover pointless murders and deaths and gruesome crime scenes and shit in this show. But really, for some reason, this one just bugs me, man. There was absolutely no point to this murder no one gained anything from it and it was to me it really seems like 1957 you can't really be a lesbian out in the open so this lady just obsessed on this one other lady and everything went to hell over it when you know had if people weren't 
so homophobic then and even now like this lady could have just walked down the street i'm so fucking gay and like found somebody else to be with instead of killing betty's husband i don't maybe i'm wrong i don't know i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about now it's time for five fast facts about halloween 50% of kids prefer to receive chocolate while trick-or-treating compared to 24% who want non-chocolate candy and 10% that want gum. So if I'm reading these numbers right, that leaves about 16% of kids who are the weirdos that are actually happy to get toothbrushes and chapstick. 2. According to Irish legend, jack-o'-lanterns are named after a stingy man named Jack who, because he had tricked the devil several times, was forbidden entrance into both heaven and hell. He was condemned to wander the earth, waving his lantern to lead people away from their path. 3. The largest pumpkin ever measured was grown by Norm Craven, who broke the world record in 1993 with an 836-pound pumpkin. 4. Souling, S-O-U-L-I-N-G, was a medieval Christian precursor to modern-day trick-or-treating on Hallow Mass, November 1st. The poor would go door to door offering prayers for the dead in exchange for soul cakes. I don't know what a soul cake is. 5. Halloween was influenced by the ancient Roman festival Pomona, which celebrated the harvest goddess of the same name. Many Halloween customs and games that feature apples, such as bobbing for apples and nuts, date from this time. In fact, in the past, Halloween has been called Sand Apple Night and Nutcrack Night. All right, so we got the first two main stories out of the way. We got the five fast facts. Uh, we're going to run through some quick stories, uh, just some other things that I was able to find out, uh, but there wasn't a whole lot of detail to them. Uh, where was I at on my notes? I know you guys love just hearing me go, uh, mm, uh, while I try to find my place in the Word document here. But I, I have to have a script. I know a lot of podcasters just have notes. I have an entire script. Almost every word I say comes from this word document I'm looking at for the episode because with my Aspie brain if I don't have this script we will be here for three hours going off on tangents that have nothing to do with the show I looked at this story as a main story uh, for the episode but I saw that Sword and Scale had already covered it so I'm just going to give you the rundown uh, 2011 18 year old Taylor Van Deist was walking to a Halloween party dressed as a zombie when she texted her friend to say that she was being creeped on she never made it to the party. She was later found alive but badly beaten near the train tracks that she had been walking down and died at the hospital from her injuries before she was able to identify her attacker. Luckily, her killer was identified as one Matthew Forrester who had followed Van Dyst in an attempt to sexually assault her. But when she fought back, Forrester panicked, strangled her, and bashed her head in with a flashlight and left her for dead. In 2014, Forrester's father, Stephen, was sentenced to three years in prison for helping hide his son when the police were looking for him. And earlier this year, Matthew was sentenced to 17 to life for second-degree murder. 17 years doesn't seem long enough uh, for someone who brutally murdered a young woman and defended his actions by saying, Oh, I just wanted to rape her. I wasn't trying to kill her. I panicked when she fought back. Fuck you, bitch boy. I hope you get stuffed with so many dicks in prison you end up looking like Cool Hand Luke after he ate the 50 eggs. October 2014. Neighbors witnessed Derek Ward, 35 years old, dragging a decapitated body into the street and kicking a head 20 feet up the road before disappearing. Assuming it was part of a Halloween prank, neighbors headed outside to try to pick up the decoration. Chillingly, they discovered this was no hoax. It was a real body. At the same time, the neighbors were being grossed out by this headless dead body the, the other guy had just left in the middle of the road. Derek was jumping in front of an oncoming Long Island Railroad train and was killed. Yeah, fucking crazy, right? The body was identified as his mother, Professor Patricia Ward. She had been a well-loved professor of language arts at Farmingdale State College. She had suffered multiple signs of trauma, multiple stab wounds, and broken ribs. Derek, who had a 10-year history of psychiatric problems and steroid use, had reportedly sat with his mother's mutilated body for a few minutes inside their blood-spattered home before taking it outside. 
since the guy's dead, he went and jumped in front of a train. How insane is that? They don't really have a lot of details. They don't know what led to him murdering her, how he murdered her. All they know is he beat the hell out of her, stabbed her, chopped her head off, and dropped her off in the street on his way to jump in front of a train. Steroids, man. Stay away from them. It's called roid rage for a reason. October 1992, and this one really pissed me off. A 16-year-old Japanese exchange student, Yoshihiro Hattori, and his homestay brother, Webb Haymaker, were invited to a party in Baton Rouge, Louisiana that was being thrown for exchange students. Dressed as John Travolta from Saturday Night Fever, Yoshihiro rang the doorbell and received no response. Unknown to the boys, they had gotten the wrong address. Bonnie Pears opened the side door of her home, saw the two, and claimed she thought they were there to rob her. She closed the door and told her husband Rodney to get his gun. As the two boys turned to go back to their car, realizing they had the wrong address, the garage door opened with Rodney Pierce wielding a 44 Magnum. He shouted, freeze, but with his limited English, Yoshihiro didn't understand the command. He was also not wearing his contacts that evening, so he didn't see the gun. Pierce mistook the camera Yoshihiro was holding for a gun and shot him in the chest, then ran back into his home like a little bitch where he didn't come out until police arrived 40 minutes later. Weird how many white people think shit like phones and cameras are guns, right? Seems to happen a lot, mostly with cops, but overall, just, uh, I don't get it. I'm a white people, I know I say stuff about white people on this show in case you've never seen a picture of me. I am a white people, but I'm not one of those white people. I'm not with them, if you know what I mean. Uh, but it seems like this happens a lot. Anytime a not white person is holding a phone or a camera or a baby, uh, suddenly to every white person around, it looks like a gun. Fucking stupid. And that's probably why this one pissed me off. The Yoshihiro died from blood loss pretty much as soon as they got him into the ambulance. After a controversial seven day trial, Pierre's was acquitted of manslaughter. Was he going to shoot every trick or treater that showed up too? It was Halloween, and their yard was decorated. People were going to show up. Even if it wasn't these two, someone was going to wander into your yard. Someone was going to look weird and probably holding fake weapons. If you're such a scaredy cat that you're going to shoot someone knocking on your door on Halloween, you don't decorate, don't hand out candy, turn off all the lights and make it very clear that you aren't participating. Otherwise, answer the door like a normal person and keep the guns and the goddamn gun safe. In a civil action, he was ordered to pay $650,000 in damages, of which his insurance only covered $100,000, leaving him responsible for the rest. As of 2013, sources report that he had lost his home and his supermarket job. That's right, at the time of this shooting, he was 30 years old and working at a grocery store like a teenager because no one had ever told him, you need to get your shit together. Sucks to be this guy, but now he doesn't even have that job. He lost his house and was last reported as living in a trailer park. And trust me, having grown up in a southern trailer park, he's as close to hell as anyone can get in this country. Kind of seems like he got what he deserved. 2004, housemates Adrian, Leslie, and Lauren had spent the evening handing out sweets to trick-or-treaters and then headed to bed. But Lauren was awoke by the sound of Adrian screaming around 1 a.m. Lauren ran outside in fear and hid in the garden where she saw an unidentified assailant climb out of a window. As more screams filled her ears, Lauren ran back inside to discover both her friends had been viciously stabbed. She called emergency services, but her two friends ended up dying. Nearly a year later, the killer was identified through cigarette butts found at the scene with DNA belonging to Eric Koppel, Adrian's best friend's fiance. Jealousy of the friendship between Adrian and this guy's girlfriend had driven him to commit the brutal murders. So the chick that heard the screams and got out of the house first is friends with, with some other lady. Like, this chick that lives in the house has a friend that friend has a fiance, and the fiance is jealous of his girlfriend's friendship with this other chick. So he breaks into the house on Halloween, tries to kill everyone in there, and doesn't even get the chick he's trying to kill. Fucking A, dude. 2012, 24-year-old Rebecca Gay was strangled to death by her mother's fiance on Halloween. The fiance, John White, 
was the pastor of a small church in Michigan with two prior convictions for violent assault against women. White was close with Gay and her three-year-old son who was home during the murder. After hitting her on the head and strangling her with a zip tie, White stripped her body and dumped it in the woods. He then went home, dressed her son for Halloween, and dropped him off at his dad's house. He later told police he was motivated to kill Gay because he wanted to have sex with a corpse. He never indicated whether he actually did or not. Oh, a church pastor killing somebody. If you look into this, and I, I'm not knocking religion here, but if you look into this, it really seems like a lot of preachers and pastors and youth pastors and priests murder so many people. And the people they don't murder, they seem to sexually assault. I don't know what the deal is. Maybe it's just the, the sexual piety implied with religion, like you got to keep your shit in your pants and, and not let it out. Bonkers. 1979, a woman is found dead off an interstate highway in Texas on the morning after Halloween. She was naked except for orange socks, and as authorities struggled to identify her, she became known as Orange Socks. Her identity still hasn't been determined, but her killer may have already come to justice. Serial killer Henry Lee Lucas confessed to picking up Orange Socks while she was hitchhiking and strangling her. Lucas later received the death penalty, but there's some doubt as to whether he actually did this particular crime. He later recanted his confessions, and authorities point out that he confessed to more than 600 murders total, almost all of which he didn't commit. This is where I will argue with the article I took this from. Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool killed around 400 people. And while they didn't kill someone every day for however many years their murder spree went on, they admitted that there were days that they killed three or four people. So their body count is suspected to be in at least the 400s. And it doesn't seem crazy that he would have confessed to 600 murders because between the two of them, they actually committed them. And Orange Socks here could have very well been uh, one of their victims. And if you're not familiar with the story of Henry Lee Lucas, I strongly suggest you look into it. Michael Rooker was in a movie called Henry. Uh, pretty dope. Go check it out. If Henry Lee Lucas said he killed somebody, I would just say he did it and let it go because he probably did. 1981, Maria Cialella was walking home on Halloween night. A police officer drove by her, saw her walking on the side of the road, and planned to offer her a ride when he passed back by on his rounds. But when he returned down that same street 10 minutes later, she was gone. Her disappearance would go unsolved until her body, along with those of three others, were found two years later. A serial killer named Richard Beigenwald had abducted her and several other girls, cut their bodies into pieces, and buried them in his mother's backyard on Staten Island. Nima Louise Carter was 19 months old when her parents put her to bed in her crib on Halloween night 1977. The next morning, the Oklahoma infant was gone. Because all the doors and windows in the house were locked, the family believed the kidnapper had already been waiting in the closet. Carter's body was found by local boys almost a month later, stuffed into a refrigerator in an abandoned house. She had died of suffocation, but there was no evidence to link anyone to her death. However, several years later, her babysitter, Jacqueline Rubidoux, would be found guilty in the death of another local girl. The girl, Mary Carpitcher, had been abducted with her twin sister, Tina Carpitcher, and placed inside a fridge in a nearby abandoned home. Tina survived, but Mary didn't. Although no one was charged in Carter's death, many believe it was Rubidoux. And this one, I can only seem to find about a paragraph or two about it. No name for the victim or anything, and I really wish there was more details. I would love to know what this person had done leading up to this story, why they did it. It just, it really interests me, but maybe it's that lack of detail that makes it so interesting. 2005, the town of Frederica, Delaware, was shocked when they discovered that what many people thought was a Halloween decoration was actually a corpse. A woman had hung herself in a tree approximately 15 feet off the ground, and thinking it was a decoration, the body was ignored for hours before police were called and they realized that it had been a suicide, and there's not even a name released with this story. 
That is it. That's the stories for Dead on Halloween, part two. What did we learn? Make sure you have the right address when you go to a party. Don't get caught up in a love triangle. Don't walk alone in the dark at night. Uh, And basically trust no one ever for any reason. Not your family, not your friends, not your lovers, not your neighbors, because they are all waiting to murder you. The show is No Better Death. Go to nobetterdeath.info for all links, news, updates, etc. Uh, please find us on iTunes and leave a review if you would be so kind. Uh, but probably more importantly, tell your friends. Spread the word of No Better Death. I feed on downloads. The more downloads the show gets, the more powerful I become. And soon enough, I will be your all-seeing, all-knowing overlord. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, wherever, whenever. No Better Death. We're there. Uh, Get at me. Let me know if you have any ideas or material you want to hear on the show. Review, subscribe, like, spread the word. And in fact, uh, I've been talking about having some sort of contest uh, to to encourage you guys to leave some iTunes reviews. So, and I'll put up pictures of this stuff whenever I get time. I've actually put together a giveaway. Let me grab my stuff here so I can take a look at it. Uh, I have in my hand... Seasons 1, 2, and 3 of Heroes, they were watched one time, are in perfect condition. Season 5 of True Blood, again, watched once or twice, perfect condition. Season 2 of Arrow, same thing. And Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles. First season. All of these DVDs are in perfect shape, and I will be giving them away to people who leave iTunes reviews for No Better Death. Uh, the heroes one, two, and three, those are going to go as a set. So whoever wins those gets all three and then, uh, Terminator arrow and true blood will all be given away separately. So that's four winners. Uh, if you're interested in getting any of these, uh, basically we have run out of room for our DVDs. We have thousands of them. Uh, we sold a bunch, we gave a bunch away and these were the ones I was like, these are too awesome to just sell to the pawn shop or give away to any rando that we know. I don't know anyone cool enough in person to give these to, but if you're listening to this, then you're definitely cool enough to give these to. So, uh, all iTunes reviews left on iTunes for no better death between November 1st and the last day of the month, I will go through and randomly select four people. I will contact you, uh, ask you which one of these you want. First name I pick gets first pick. Second name I pick gets second pick. Da da da. You know how numbers work. One, two, four, five. Uh, so we're going to be giving these away. I'll throw up pictures as soon as I get a chance so you know that it's not just some trash, uh, scratched up pieces of shit. These are in perfect shape. I don't want to sell them to the pawn shop or give them away. So I'm going to offer them to you guys in exchange for iTunes reviews. And that is it. Uh, That's all I got for this episode. Uh, Next episode, which I do plan on actually recording on time this time, uh, we're going to be looking at deaths on Black Friday. Shop till you drop dead. Uh, And it's not cool, some of these stories I've looked into. I'll give you a little teaser piece of information. Do you know what the most common injury on Black Friday is? Do, 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 do. pepper spray guys people just mash out to sales with pepper spray in their pocket ready to mace somebody so they can snatch some cheap shit that's right i'll be back next week with that episode i am sick grayson wishing you the most wickedest of late halloweens until next time try not to die i'm gonna play you guys out with a little number known as the halloween thing